being here and to, for connecting with us. A uh, special thank you and hi to our students, whether online or on campus. Today we'll have, uh, um, our topic today is making sense of the business climate in 2022. And let me introduce you our speaker, Dr. Chi Pyong, who's here with us today. Thank you for being here. How are you? Hi, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm fine. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. So Dr. Pyong has been a professor in business for about 22 years, and he has conducted business research in economics, accounting, and finances for about 15 years. He also has been a business owner for 20 years and is specifically involved in franchise operations here in the U.S., right? That's correct, Sarah. That's um, very interesting. Yes, thank you. And this topic is actually a very interesting one because I believe it affects everyone. So we're going to have a good time. I'm going to explain some of the terminologies that I'm going to be using. Maybe you're not familiar with it, but I think that after the end of the session, everybody will be an expert in this topic. Hopefully, because yeah, it's a very complex topic. So it please is. keep it simple, sure. easy words that everybody can understand. And uh, let's dive in, into this topic. So let's talk about how we're going to make sense of the business climate in 2022. And uh, you know, if you have any tips for us, for the students, for the audience, let us know. Give us a little introduction, please. Sure. Uh, so in 2022, we have just come off this pandemic situation. Uh, we think that we're at the tail end of it, but yet there are still some challenges that you started to hear about on the internet, on the news. And the key themes here are inflation, supply chain disruptions, uh, of course, pandemic still ongoing. Uh, and then how does it affect us as consumers, as a business owner? So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Yeah, that point is really interesting. So how does it affect consumers, business owners, and also investors? Let's sure. dive into those three categories. Sure. As a consumer, we buy things on a daily basis. Uh, we go to the shop, we go to the grocery stores, we shop around for clothes. Uh, we are traveling nowadays. And so we're constantly shopping and we constantly look for prices that fit what our budget is all about. And we also think about the decisions that we're going to make for the future. How does it uh, affect us? So as a consumer, I think that uh, you're probably inundated with the information such as pricing, such as inflation, and that's con constantly in our minds today. Yes. So, so I think that also businesses, they are also thinking about inflation plus the recession that many uh, of the business outlets have been talking about. So those two themes are affecting our decision-making processes. Right. And what about, uh, so what about specifically business owners? Business owners, you know, they are looking at how to navigate through the supply chain disruption. So for example, right. if let's say you are a retailer and uh, you have some products uh, being shipped to you from, let's say, China. China is the exactly. factories of the world, and it's stuck in the port. So what do they do? Well, they would have to fill up their shelves, but perhaps look for other suppliers, perhaps look for domestic suppliers, uh, perhaps also uh, find some other products, not from China specifically, but uh, to fill up the shelves so that they can sell something. So I think as a business owner, you know, the challenges are real because you know, you want to be continuously earning a profit and right. having an empty shelf means that you are not selling and therefore no profit for you. And do you have any tip for business owners and how to overcome that challenge? Yeah, so, you know, there are many challenges. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I think business owners have started looking at is selling more online. So they've right. looked at, you know, strategies to market and move products from there, maybe to eBay, to Amazon. Uh, just two different ways that are available today. So nothing new. Obviously, eBay and Amazon has been around for 20 years, so they are easily uh, mimicking the, the, those business concepts, selling strategies and, and those concepts. So as a business owner, you have to be able to adapt. Okay. And what about for investments? Would you invest uh, right now? So is it a good moment? So the investment uh, markets, the financial markets are having a difficult time. Um, you've heard of the crypto market that is having some challenges. Uh, the stock yeah. market is having some challenges. The financial market, which includes the currency market, is also having a difficult time because the United States currency, being the strongest currency at the moment, 
results in all other currency being weaker, that means that when they are trying to buy products from the United States, it makes it more expensive for them. So in that sense, um, you know, in the, the investment climate is highly dependent on macroeconomic news. It's highly dependent on news that are surrounding our environment today. So there's a lot of uncertainties. But as an investment strategy, uh, you typically look at long term, meaning uh, five years or more, 10 years or more, right up to retirement age, which some of us tend to retire around 60, 65, uh -huh. 70 years old. So there's, there's some time there to, to think about the investment uh, and how it will do in the future. The return. Mm -hmm. So it's still a good moment to invest somehow. Sure. I would say that it's never a bad time to invest, especially if you're thinking about retirement. Retirement is when you want to enjoy your time when you're older. So let's say if you're 65 and you want to enjoy, let's say, the rest of your the time in your life, let's say 20 or 30 years, um, you don't want to work as hard. So having some investment right now and let it accumulate uh, until the time when you're ready to retire would definitely help. Because ultimately, you know, people don't plan for these things, but it's worthwhile thinking yeah. about it. That's right. So before we move on, my next question, I would like to remind all of our audiences, whether it's students or just public people, um, I would like to tell you that you guys can put your questions in the chat box here, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of our of our presentation, our introduction with Dr. Pyong. Um, at the end of the of today's session, we're going to respond all of you guys. So keep writing, keep texting. We're going to read you in a, just in a little bit, okay? So let's now. I have a, my next question is about obviously inflation because it's a very current topic, sure. and I would like to dive into that deeply. Uh, so what are the effects of inflation right now? Sure. So I want to talk about inflation from maybe two or three perspective. I think it's important to understand when people start talking about inflation, what is it? Why haven't I heard about it in my last 20, 30 years? And uh, I think that's a very uh, important thing to talk about. So for most of us who live in the United States, uh, maybe you come from a different part of the world, you may, you may have experienced inflation. So for example, if you come from Venezuela uh -huh. or Colombia or, or Brazil, uh, these places have experienced inflation. But in the United States in general, for the last, uh, I'd say, 20 years, we have not had significant inflation. So the, the numbers, the official numbers, stand anywhere from 1.2% to 3%. Uh, because the government, the United States government, believes that inflation is such an important thing that controls our lives. So. What I'm talking about here is pricing of products and services. So the government has always kept in the back of their minds to handle the inflation rate, uh, so much so that it never has been a problem for the last 20 years, as I mentioned. Uh, but lately, we started to see inflation creep up uh, to now 8.7% in the last quarter. 8 .7. So triple that amount. And you know when we translate that amount to earning, so if you earn money, for example, if you earn a dollar today, well, that's not enough to cover the increase in price of goods and services that we're talking about. So inflation is the increase of price of goods and services. Very commonly, you've heard about gasoline. Uh -huh. Petrol is a a commodity that we buy on a daily basis, not maybe not daily, but two or three days, you need gasoline. And you can see that the prices jump up and down, yeah. mostly up on a daily basis. That's inflation. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, when you buy eggs, for example, it used to cost $1.99 for eggs. Now it's $2.99, $3.99. So that's inflation. That's what we're talking about here. Now, it doesn't apply to every single thing that you buy. But in general, we start to see a rise in prices in almost everything that we, we, we buy today. What are the exact reasons? Because you say in the sure. last 20 years, it didn't happen, hasn't happened. So why now? Uh, that was, that, that's a, that's a very question. interesting question. So number one, uh, there's a lot of hype, hype in the news. When there is a hype in the market, in the news, on the internet, on the radio, you know, people, it, it seemed to be locked into our mind. So part of it is, is um, I would say, uh, 
just in the news, what, whatever news that is, it, you know, it, it, it allows people to think about it. And then all of a sudden they put it into, into implementation, which means that, you know, we're thinking about inflation. How does that affect? And one of the things I want to talk about is rent. Rent is yeah, also I was about to say that yes, rent. going through inflation. You know, a lot of people talk about inflation, rise in prices, of goods and services. All of a sudden, you know, your land landlord or your uh, property manager says, uh, we're going to have to raise your rent. Mm -hmm. uh, in okay. fact, my dog sitter, uh, whom I always uh, ask my dog sitter to look after the dogs, she said to me the other day, um, I'm going to have to charge you $4 more per dog. And I asked her why. Well, she said, inflation. Yeah. <laughs> so how does that translate to everything? I, and, you know, I'm thinking that maybe she has to buy bread, eggs, all the things that she has to pay for. Now she has to pay extra. And as a result, she has to charge me more. So it's a very vicious cycle, circular cycle. And everybody's eventually going to start to phase all of that. Uh, and what is what do you think the government can do to reduce hmm. this? Well, um, going back to the other question, which how does it get into this whole picture? Another thing is also supply chain disruption. I'll give you an example. So let's say if you're a bakery and you need flour and eggs, uh, and let's say there's a disruption in the production of eggs and milk and things that you need as a raw ingredient, well, that's a problem for you because now the cost to buy eggs and milk has gone up. And as a result, you as a business owner, as a baker or bakery shop, you're going to have to decide whether or not you're going to raise the price of your product or to keep it the same and absorb the cost that has gone up. Now, what can we do? What can the government do? Uh, in some countries, the governments have subsidized the price of eggs and milk and things like that. Very unusual in the United States. We don't see subsidies mm -hmm. to that effect. Uh, but as a control measure, and that's not a lot, the government can only do one or several things. And primarily in the United States, the government has raised interest rate. Why interest rate? Well, because the thinking is that because the economy consumes, spends money, one way to curb people's spending is to make things more expensive. I know it's counterintuitive, doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But if things are more expensive, it's going to force you to start thinking of your decision to spend. So now instead of saying, OK, I'm going to buy eggs for $2.99, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to try to find some substitute, maybe an egg substitute or something. <laughs> I know, I know it's, it's a little bit crazy, but but That's, then the effect, the hope the effect is to reduce then that price. Correct. Nobody's correct. buying it, so then that reduces the price. It's to force people to change their mentality. Uh, then you, you you consume less, and then as a result, hopefully that price factor will start to come down. So it has to stabilize. That price factor increase has to stabilize. It comes down and stabilizes with the supply. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. So we got the inflation part. So what about stagflation? Because we oh, hear wow. about okay. that a lot too. So <laughs> sure. keep it simple. So. Sure. <laughs> so again, stagflation is a terminology that we haven't heard a lot about. In fact, uh, in the last 30, 35 years, we certainly have not heard about that. But stagflation very simply is stagnant. The economy is stagnant. Mm -hmm. But one differentiation is the high unemployment. Now, fortunately, in the United States, we don't have high unemployment. We have actually very low unemployment. But the numbers from the Federal Reserve show that the economic activity has now declined and declined for the last two consecutive quarters. So in the United States, the stagflation uh, terminology or definition doesn't fit the economy right now. In fact, if anything, it's closer to recession. But for some countries, because of a decline in economic activity and a high unemployment, that's a problem. So for example, Europe, some countries in Europe have high unemployment, also a decline in economic activity. In South Latin America, same thing. We have high unemployment and de a decline in economic activity. So by definition, those countries would be facing stagflation, uh, a, stag a stagnant economy at this moment. Okay. 
rather than a recession. Rather than a recession. Rather than a recession. recession. So Correct. that's good to talk about. What about the recession? Will we experience in the U.S. Sure. and globally as well a recession soon? You know, the thing about uh, a recession is that there is, although a perfect definition, uh, the definition is two consecutive declines in economic activity, uh, you know, despite the fact that that definition is the pure economic definition, you know, some economies like to look at other factors like unemployment, like the consumer price index, like the industrial price index, or other factors. Uh, certainly not the financial markets. Stock, stock market is not used as a gauge. In the United States, we use other factors like housing, housing, new housing sales, new car sales uh, as a measure to determine whether or not in, we're in a recession. But the thing is that most of the time, the United States government does not like to announce that the United States is in, in a recession. And the, the reason is because there's a big implication. The implication is that it's enough to change people's minds about spending, spending habits, uh, planning for the next few months or years. So for that reason, they decided not to do the announcement as quickly as we know that we're in a recession. Rather, they would wait until when the time is right. And that time, which, whichever which is right, I'm not really sure. But sometimes they don't even announce it until it's over. So right now, we're already in a recession? <laughs> well, that's the million dollar question. Yes, it's because a, <laughs> that's by, what we want to know. By definition, in the last two quarters, our economic activity, the United States economic activity has declined. And so technically, yes, we're in a recession. But you know, obviously, nobody likes to say that we are in a recession. OK, so not officially. Not officially, <laughs> that's correct. That's good, at least. <laughs> So um, who will it affect the most if we are going to experience a recession? Yeah, so there are select industries, as I mentioned, that will be highly affected. Uh, banking industry will be highly affected. Uh, the retail industry will be highly affected. Uh, the housing has already been affected because of the raise in interest rate, the rise in interest rate, which makes things a little bit more expensive. Subsequently, all of the industries related to housing, like the construction industry, the mortgage industry, all will be affected because of the rise in mortgage. So it has, a, a, again, a, an effect on subsection, sub, sub um, categories. categories of okay. the of the economy. So. All right. So um, let's see, since there are very interesting topics, inflation, recession, stagflation, let's see if someone has any questions so far. We're going to check our audience in our chat box here. Nobody so far? No? All no right. So, so let's far. keep on uh, asking questions sure. and talking about the business climate in 2022. So my next question was about COVID-19. Of course, we're still experiencing some period of outbreaks here and there. Um, some part of the world, they yeah. still do have a lot of outbreaks. Uh, you know, it's ongoing, an ongoing thing, right? So has infection levels continued to affect the business climate? Is, it, um, is, there, is that an effect? of COVID-19 still in 2022? Yeah, I, I suspect that we're going to see pockets of in, infection. For example, yesterday in the news, Macau, which is uh, mm -hmm. a, a region of China, uh, announced a closure of, and, and Macau is known for gambling. Yes. At the last day of, oh, Asia. of Asia. Exactly. They are now ordered to close for a whole week. So can you imagine if you're a, a, a casino business and you're earning lots and lots of revenue from people gambling, now it's all of a sudden shut it for a whole week. That is a lot of lost revenue. So I think periodically you will hear about closure of businesses, closure of you know cities or regions uh, or cities or, or you know wherever the case may be, uh, you're going to continue to see that. That's going to be part of our lives now. I believe. So, so it's going to be here for a long time. Yes. In, I, in I, this way, like uh, um, outbreaks, ongoing, correct. closing again. Correct. Like it's a vicious cycle. Vicious cycle, exactly. Right. But hopefully it's not a, a prolonged lockdown. Uh, you know that you've heard about China in some parts of China, like Shanghai and Shenzhen. They closed down for six, six weeks. 
lockdown in six weeks. But you're talking about this year or in 2020? Just happened right in now? the last two, okay. three months. And so, you know, if you think about that again, China being the factory of the world, manufacturing auto parts, manufacturing consumer goods, you know, that highly affects a business. Let's say if you're in a business like auto manufacturing, you know, these factories produce the parts for your business. And so, you know, you now have an unfinished product and you right. cannot sell an unfinished product like a car, for example, you need, you know, 20,000 parts. And even if, if one part is missing, you can no longer sell that car. Yeah, this is happening a lot in the car industry. I've noticed, yes, correct. Right? Yes. They're still missing parts. Yes, General Motors, I think the last report, 95,000 cars unfinished. <gasps> Tesla wow. having the same issue with supply chain disruption. Yeah. So it's That's a big incredible. deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big problem. So um, let's see if we have any questions. Guys, I remind you that you guys can keep texting or, you know, if you have any doubt about the topic, question, some curiosity to ask Dr. Pyong, we will happily uh, answer all of them right now or at the end of our session in a Q&A section. For now, nothing. One question. One let's question. see. Okay. And we still have a, a few questions. We still have a few questions to go sure. through, but I wanted to make for, you know them part of the conversation. Let's see that question. Do we have it? What is the question? Okay, they're typing. Give us a second. Okay, they're typing. <laughs> so let's uh, uh, maybe move on to the next question before the um, you know they finish typing. So I also would like to ask you, um, um, so the investment market have recently entered a bear market. Mm, so please okay. explain to us in, in key words, simple <laughs> words, what a bear market is. Okay. So the way the public, the investment, investment public perceives the market, two parts. One is a bull market. One is a bear market. Mm -hmm. A bull market is, as the term implies, bull. We are bullish about the market. We're happy about what's going on. And so we feel really good. A bear market is the opposite of a bull market. So think about a bear. What does a bear do during the winter time? Bear goes to sleep. So what seems to be happening is that people are feeling lousy at this moment. So instead of having to go through this investment cycle, which is, you know, let's buy, buy stocks, buy, buy currency, buy oil, buy any types of investment tool, they're saying, uh, let's just wait and see. So they're kind of asleep, if you can think about it that way, hibernating, and they're waiting for the opportunity, waiting for more certainty to happen before they dive into investments. So we go into investments to earn a return, mm -hmm. meaning that we buy low, we sell high. Right. It's the perfect strategy for anything in oil, in stock market, in crypto, whatever markets that you're in is to buy low and sell high. But there's no, not a lot of activities going on right now. And so that's why the term comes about where all the big players are hibernating, they're sleeping. So it's the bear market. Makes sense. Yeah. And so, yeah, I've noticed that though in real estate right now in Miami specifically, sure. people are still investing a lot. That's why rent, you know, the prices are very, very sure. high still. Mm -hmm. Is that gonna, is it, this is the bubble that's gonna pop soon or later, or, you know, give us a prediction. If okay. You can. Well, this housing situation is a little bit different from the previous housing crisis. The last, and let me take you back to the last situation. The last situation resulted from a financial crisis, primarily because of people who borrowed money to buy homes, but didn't have uh, a job, <laughs> didn't have income, they didn't have a collateral, and they were still able to get a loan to mm -hmm. buy a house. Yeah. Uh, but now we have better quality, uh, you know, good quality credit people who bought homes. And so they still have a job. They are able to continue to pay their mortgages and so forth. But in select markets like Miami, for example, this is a very hot market, as yeah. you know, because of the beaches, the weather, uh, people who travel from all over the world who come to this place, they really enjoy uh, having lived here. So the lifestyle is part of that equation. 
And so I don't think that this market is going to suffer like what we experienced before, but you never know. You know, right. people could start to default on their mortgages. They may have lost a job. And that's where the million dollar question before, which was the recession. If a recession happens, what happens? Well, if a recession, a severe recession would happen and companies do lay off in masses, then we're going to experience that problem related to mortgages and people keeping their payments up to date and so forth. But I don't think that's the situation. I think there is still uh, a really good market, hot market here in, in Miami because, you know, there's not a lot of places in the world or country like Miami, like Miami. Miami is a very sought after <laughs> exactly. location right exactly. now in 2022 after the pandemic. Actually, sure. after. So anyways, so it's not going to be treated like other location, other place or other time. Yeah, we started to see in new in the news story, Las Vegas is starting to see some decline in home prices. Uh, people are selling their homes, reduce the prices of asking prices of their homes. And so we start to see some places do that. But in general, I think Miami is just going to remain high, if not higher, if not even appreciate more. Correct. Great. That's good news for all of us. That's good news for people in Why Miami. Why young, of course. Um, all right, so let's see that question. What can people and companies do to deal with the recession and not end up bankrupt? So let's repeat. What can people mm. and businesses do can do to deal with the recession and not end up bankrupt? To deal with the recession and not end up bankrupt. So bankrupt. that's a very important okay. question. Uh, yeah. So I'll talk about the for for consumers in general. In terms of the consumers, uh, obviously you want to plan. Planning is a very key part of this whole equation. If you're working for a company and you think that you you've heard rumors about your company having, let's say, problems, financial problems, uh, I think you you know the the the, the common sense thing and common means you are thinking about what's what to do in the next two, four, six months, maybe a year down the road is to start to to look for another job, uh, look right. for another position, even though you're comfortable with that position. That's from the consumer perspective, right? I mean, because you have to sustain life. You have to have a job, right? A job, a good paying job. If you have a certain lifestyle, if you have mortgages and things like that, you have to continue to pay. So for that reason, short of already having let's say your nest egg a nest egg is you save money to allow you to sustain life is to find uh, another position for businesses uh, the biggest problem is cash flow so if you don't have enough cash from sales you would have to continue to look for borrowing so meaning that you're going to have to go out to the banks to borrow, maybe sell bonds, uh, maybe uh, downsize your business, meaning eliminate workers, Cost. eliminate costs. Um, and so you're going to have to do a lot of things to counter this until things change. Uh, and, you know, things can change very quickly. It, you know, it, it doesn't take years to change, but, you know, you have to assume the worst case scenario and you're going to have to plan. So same thing with us, we're going to have to plan. So fail to plan, plan to fail. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> Obviously, nobody plans to fail, yeah. but you know things happen in life. And I believe that when doors close, bigger doors open, mm -hmm. sometimes even bigger doors open. You just got to have faith and you got to plan and be prepared to change. Yeah, planning is a big part of the equation, sure. right? Exactly. All right. Do we have any other questions for now? No, no, okay. no, for now. So let's keep with our question. So I wanted to talk about a very current topic, something that is happening right now in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Ukraine and Russia, of course, yep. are at war mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And uh, so although no other countries are currently involved, how is it directly impacting the rest of the world and specifically businesses? Wow. Okay. Well, that's a very important uh, question because maybe you don't think that you're affected by the war of course we're not in a war right now us united states uh, actually we are <laughs> and i'll explain that in a few minutes but russia is a producer of many commodities what am i talking about commodities like 
uh, gasoline, not gasoline, oil, crude oil. Well, we're seeing the, the mm -hmm. effect already here. Correct. Petroleum products, uh, natural gas. They are also uh, exporters of nickel and cobalt used for rechargeable batteries. They also produce uh, iron to make steel, you know, steel for making cars and things like that. So they are producers of commodities, things that are not usually found in other parts of the world. They are also agricultural producers of wheat and nitrogen-based fertilizers. And so those products are important for countries that consume a lot of wheat. Wheat are used in you know, a lot of things, bread and so forth. But the fertilizer are primarily consumed by countries that have a lot of agriculture. So Malaysia and Indonesia, those places buy a lot of fertilizers. And so with uh, a shortage of these products, obviously, because of the sanction, the sanction is when the United States and its allies tell Russia, hey, you can no longer do business with some other countries of the world. You now have a decrease in the supply of those products that you need. As a result, they have to shop around for the products like fertilizer. They can find it, but the prices are going to most likely go up. As a result, because of the raw materials that they need, the prices have gone up, it translates to everything else being more expensive. So the end result is that everyone's going to see a rise in prices. Again, translating back to inflation. Right. Inflation. So there's no way around this because it's a vicious cycle. The supply chain has been disrupted. The producers, even though they can produce because of alternate suppliers, the end result is the consumers have to see price increase. There's no way around this. There's no way around this. Unless, you know, we find another supplier and there's an abundance of nitrogen-based fertilizer, abundance of wheat, abundance of everything else, we won't see any resolution at the moment. So, and how long are we going to see the effect okay. of this? Uh, well, as long as the war carries on, mm -hmm. we're going to see it continuously happening and deteriorating over time. Even until, even after the war ends for Ukraine and Russia, we still will see continuous disruption and increases in prices because, you know, a war is very detrimental to an economy. I mean, imagine places yeah. are bombed. The, Farmlands are bombed, infrastructure is bombed. Uh -huh. Yeah, so there's a disruption in every single thing, not just, oh, the war is over, we're fine, uh, things don't get fixed right away. And the part that I mentioned how the United States is dragged into this is because the United States is a supporter of Ukraine and supplies all the military hardware. And military hardware costs a lot of money. So the United States are, is dragged in indirectly, even though they're, we're not involved in the war directly, the money part comes from the United States. So as of right now, I think some almost a trillion dollars has been spent. It's a, it's a very big drain on the finances of the United States and the West. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for this sure. answer. Do we have any other questions from our audience? All right, I do have another question sure. that people are talking about, actually. So what about the 401k mm. retirement accounts? So for people who don't live in the U.S., 401k is a retirement, retirement plan, yes. of course. And um, so what if I wish to retire in 2022? Mm -hmm. Seeing that my retirement investment has declined in this market, market what would you suggest to do? Like, what, what are we going to do? <laughs> okay. What is your uh, best tip for us? Well, if I if I may suggest this, one thing is that if you're getting ready to retire and you all of a sudden you're interested to see the value of your retirement fund and you log on, you see, wow, everything's in red or it's declined by $100,000, $200,000, how am I going to retire? All the answer is you're going to have to wait. Keep working. You're going to have to keep working, maybe not full-time, maybe part-time. 
maybe just to earn some money, just to help you prolong this period of time because eventually all of this will go away. The million dollar question is when? We don't know when. I, I can't give you an answer. I, I don't think anybody can give you an answer right. at the moment, but there's not a lot of things that you can do uh, other than just to wait because the situation, well, if, if you got out of it before the war, before all these problems crept up, you'll be fine. But not a lot of us have a crystal ball. I don't have a crystal ball. Right. And so uh, at this moment, you're just going to have to wait until the dust has settled. And then hopefully within a year or so, uh, all, the, all the monies that you've lost will come back uh, because typically there is a recovery. That's a, a word for investments is recovery uh, that takes place uh, a year or two after a serious event has happened. Okay. Sometimes it's longer. Sometimes it could be up to five years. Uh, back in, uh, let's say, 1996, I bought an apartment. I bought that apartment for 91000 And in the crash of the housing crisis of 2006 and seven, my apartment went from 91000 to 15000 and I had to wait Here almost, in the US? Yes, almost five years for it to recover. Wow. Uh, and so I waited for it to recover. And then uh, after maybe a year or two later, I made a miserable $10,000 more above the 91000 yeah, yeah. So it's not bad. You had to wait. Though. But That's I had to wait. That's the key, Correct. to wait. Time cures everything. Right. Time cures everything. So in this whole uh, equation, you're going to have to wait patiently. Patience. No choice. Patience is Patience. the key. Patience. Patience is a virtue. <laughs> it is. All right. So if we don't have any other questions, yeah, we do. Okay. Let's see. Looking at the current global situation, the global condition is not so favorable for businesses at the moment with the recession, post-pandemic situation, global condition, war, climate, and weather changes. But we, on the other hand, can see an increased demand for alternative energy energy efficiency mm -hmm. products and yep. solutions as in solar and wind energy generators, electric vehicles with smart batteries. In your opinion, would this be the next way to go for international entrepreneurs? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think that some countries have already resorted to its renewable energy. Uh, for example, Germany is a proponent of renewable energy and they have no choice because they rely mostly on Russia for gas, natural gas, and also crude products. So right now, because they think that they're going to be cut off from Russia, they're working towards reverting back to coal or headed towards renewable energy. I still think that this is a slow process because even though the renewable energy like solar and, and things like that are, are already there. Uh, the cost of putting all these infrastructure in place is extremely expensive, extremely high. So for example, if you wanted solar power, solar panels on mm -hmm. your roof, it would cost you $45,000 and upwards to have those. And the return on investment, let's say you spend $45,000, you are not going to get the return right away because it's over time that you recover that, that cost. Uh, let's say if you're interested in, in an EV, electric vehicle. I mean, electric vehicles right now are extremely expensive. They go anywhere from 50,000 to over 100,000. Again, the return is not immediate. So this is a personal uh, decision, I believe, uh, for you and for governments, select governments, they're thinking how how do we handle the situation at hand? Uh, the situation at hand is it's continuous changing and continuously changing to either benefits your situation or some other situation. And uh, and again, I, I don't have a perfect answer for you. I'm sorry, but it's I think it's personally based on you. So if you have uh, if you have some excess money to spend on renewable energy, like solar panels and things like that, EV, uh, I'm, I'm not yet a proponent of EV uh, because I think we're not there yet, you know. Um, so eventually at some point in time, we will have uh, uh, 
a lot of efficiency in charging electric vehicles. So an example I want to give you is, you know, we used to have a cellular phone. Remember, Sarah, if yeah. you had a cellular phone, how long did it take you to charge a cellular phone? The whole night. Whole night. Okay. Well, that's not efficient, right? If you needed the the cell phone, if if you if your cell phone died today, right now, and you need to talk to somebody, it's dead for the next six hours. It's not efficient. But thankfully, our our charging now has accelerated. I can now charge my phone in under 40 minutes, and I'll get half a charge. So I'm okay. So think about that in terms of your car, if you're traveling a distance, and if you have to continuously stop to charge your car on a long distance trip, it's not efficient. You, know, you, you certainly don't want that compared to if you drive a car and you can just fill it up in five minutes and continue your journey. So that's the situation we have to compare with. We're still not there. We're still not there. We're there, we're getting there, but getting we're, there. we're not there yet completely, but hopefully, Hopefully, uh, you know, the, all the technologies that are coming about will just gain efficiency. That's what we're talking about. Efficiency is the key here. And sustainability. And sustainability, it of comes course. Comes together. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. So do we have any other questions? I reminded you guys that you can text your questions in the chat box here. Um, so if you don't have any other questions, I have one last question sure. for Dr. Pyong. So that can recap the, our entire session today. So if I want to start a business today in mm -hmm. 2022, mid-year, yep. uh, considering the climate and challenges that we have been mentioning during our session, would you recommend that I take a calculated risk to start my business or wait for a better entry time? So that's a very good question um, related to business. Um, and this question is just based on my personal opinion. Uh, in business, you only need one good idea. And that one good idea really concerns what people need. People need food, people need clothing, people need this and that for their lifestyle or to sustain life. So if you can think about a business that people need and that idea can be easily executed by opening up a business either online or in retail in a brick and mortar setting, then I suggest, great, if you can find the financing and you're ready to embark on that venture, I say go for it. However, if, you're, if you don't have a good idea, and, and that's the key, the good idea, one good idea. If you don't have that good idea and you still have to continue to explore, I would say continue to explore and wait until you figure things out and then embark on it. Because that idea is everything. It's not just saying, oh, I'm passionate in this. I'm not... I'm not saying that because you're passionate, you know, wait. If you're passionate and you have a great idea, well, then do it. And the business plan. And, have a good uh, business plan. Of course, plan. business plan as well. That's business plan is the way to manage the business. How do you want to the business to work and things like that. So, great. I like the business plan idea. Right. I think it's important <laughs> to mention. All right. So, thank you so much. That's my pleasure. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, uh, let's check just one more time. Anybody's typing? No. All right. So I will thank again our Dr. Thank Pion you. for being here. Thank you so much. I think you gave us a lot of valuable information. This is going to be ho hopefully useful for a lot of us and the students and the audience that followed us today. Um, thank you so much again for being here. I'll see you next time to our open class and goodbye. Bye, everybody.